that police's emergency? Oh, police officers! Elite police units created to crack the toughest of cases. My role is investigating serious and organised crime. This was out of the ordinary and this was a high pressure situation. Hey, hey. Stop. Calm yourself down. Their task, tackle the villains. The lots of us wish to murder, all right? And bring them to justice. A real who did it? With unique access to some of Britain's most talented detectives, we explore, for the first time, their investigations. We've spent years putting together all of these tiny pieces of evidence. Their methods. The most bizarre investigation I've been involved in. And the evidence that's put some of the UK's most dangerous criminals behind bars. They look clever and they're dangerous. So I'll show you a picture of, of the knife. The photograph I'll call Exhibit RF3. So I'll hold that picture up for you. That is blunt. Okay. I thought you were talking about a different one. Knife crime in the UK is on the rise, and all too often it involves young people. There's a time in my life I thought I was cool. I thought all of these knives looked cool. They shouldn't be carrying knives. It's just very sad, very sad. The age of the suspect, the age of the victim, is quite hard hitting. It, it does stay with you. In many cases, the internet plays a deadly role. For me, it opens up more concerning issues around the use of social media, how influenced young people are on social media. See, look at murder someone. Look at me. And how aggressive people can become. Look at me! You know the Honestly, social media should be put in a hole and buried. I really hate it. Surrey is very affluent. It has a lot of very nice affluent areas. It does have its fair share of crime, but in general, it's a safe place to live. My name is Simon Dunn. I am a Detective Chief Inspector with Surrey and Sussex Major Crime Team. And primarily our role is to investigate homicides, kidnap and anything else that is deemed a major crime. The best bit about working in the Major Crime Team is that when we deploy to investigate a homicide where someone has lost their life, there is a huge drive amongst the whole team that essentially no one goes home until it's solved. On the 27th of May 2022, I was one of the major crime on-call SIOs for the weekend. It's Friday night, and a police response unit has been called to an incident. What are the brief details of the job? Because we are literally right on it, and I don't want to stumble across anything. I was contacted by my colleague that I was on call with and told me that there had been a stabbing outside of a house party in Camberley. Essentially, it's been a performance call there saying there's been a fight and then I've got a male that's been stabbed outside the informant's address. I got it's like um, They're saying that he's not new there. It's fair to say that those officers encountered quite a difficult and challenging scene. There were friends of the victim who in vain had tried to save his life, who were extremely, as you can imagine, very emotional, very angry, and other party goers as well, who couldn't believe in what had happened. The victim is 17-year-old Kyle Wright, and despite the best efforts of his friends and paramedics, Kyle is pronounced dead at 11.14 p.m. I mean, this doesn't happen. You know, when you go to a party, you don't expect one of your friends to be, to be stabbed. The party house and street are now a crime scene. And the following morning, Simon takes over as lead detective of Operation Hillcrest. I sat down to watch a briefing at half past eight and I was then given information 
It was a birthday party of a 16-year-old girl, and she had invited numerous friends and friends of friends. It was half term, and there was some celebrations there. The victim was 17-year-old Carl Wright, a local boy from the Aldershot area, and uh, he was also one of the friends of, of the person whose party it was. Simon also learns about a potential suspect. Additionally, we had a police vehicle that was attending the incident that had passed an individual on a mountain bike. As the cyclist goes past, he's briefly caught on camera. No description of anyone at the moment. All that is at a younger age, and then just teenage. Yeah, it's bad. Was we're going to go round? We're going to stop him. When those officers had seen that individual on a mountain bike, they did a quick U-turn and tried to catch up with that person, but they were unable to find him. It's a missed opportunity, but at the crime scene, multiple accounts from partygoers point to one man. The leaders immediately followed up with detectives tracking the named individual to his home. There had been an arrest made in the early hours of the morning. The individual was mentioned more than once by witnesses at the party. And there certainly was information that suggested that he was involved. So that was a priority for me to either rule him in or rule him out and to establish the facts of what had happened. And that takes a good team effort. That takes good dedication and allocation from myself downwards to members of the team. The CCTV in this investigation was vital, and that's where Leanne came in. The best part about my job would be making the difference. And ultimately, you're doing it for the victims and the victim's family. One of the first bits of CCTV that was seized was from our house, which was at the junction of where the incident took place. The whole incident was captured on a ring doorbell and I watched that CCTV footage. The house party was on the left-hand side of the road. It showed Kyle and his friends come out to the road. They were in a good mood. They were laughing and joking with each other. After around 15 minutes, they go back to the party. 20 minutes later, another person can be seen approaching. In the background, some metres behind, you could see a figure that was slowly walking, hiding in and out of the bushes along the roadside, making his way towards the group. Two, then three of Carl's friends have now come back. As he met with the group, there was a discussion of some sort. It's at this point, Kyle also returns. Carl and his three friends were facing the assailant, and he was significantly smaller, around five foot six, five foot five. And from that, you can see him with a rucksack pull out what appears to be a weapon. Then with one clear shot. He stabbed Carl uh, once. That force propelled Carl Wright backwards, and the suspect ran off down the road in which he came. Having been struck by what appears to be a large, bladed weapon, Kyle runs off screen. And then you watch him come back into camera, and you see him collapse, and that is the end of his life. It was just quite hard to sort of, like, imagine that children of that age, teenage years, have had to deal with that or witness that or even go through trying to save a friend's life. The footage was really grainy. It's quite rare that you get footage on any CCTV system that gives you a clear indication of a person. It's impossible to identify any faces, but Simon is certain of one thing, and it's not good news. 
It was at that point where it became quite clear to me that with all the best intentions, we had arrested someone who may be completely innocent and we still had a dangerous individual out and about somewhere and we needed to get hold of him as soon as possible. It's the morning after the fatal stabbing of 17-year-old Kyle Wright. Surrey police have a suspect in custody, but lead detective Simon Dunn believes he may not have been involved. The individual was quickly arrested at his home address. However, reviewing the CCTV, it became really apparent to me that he was significantly taller than the assailant in the CCTV footage. Simon needs to speak to the three youths that directly witnessed the attack. So the victim's friends who were with him when he was stabbed were extremely traumatised, extremely scared about giving information to the police. However, through a dedicated approach by my officers, we were able to establish from the three witnesses descriptions and details of the offender. I knew that the victim was 5 foot 11 and the assailant was significantly smaller. The detailed statement from one of the victim's friends supported that and said that our suspect was five foot five, Asian looking, spoke with a local accent and was wearing specific clothing, dark clothing. This confirms that the young man in custody is not the killer, but Simon is not ready to release him yet. The realization proved to be a bit of a challenge for an SIO because on one hand, you don't know what his involvement is he may have conspired with the assailant to stab the victim, but he may be completely innocent. Since the mid-90s, the overall number of crimes committed in the UK has decreased. Knife crime, however, appears to be going in the opposite direction. In 2021, police recorded over 50,000 offences involving knives or sharp instruments. That's 78% more than a decade ago. And of the 282 people killed by knives that year, 51 were between 13 and 19 years old. On the Saturday morning, I went to the scene and I was able to get a really good feel as to what I'd seen on CCTV. The area where this happened, it was a tranquil area of Camberley, very affluent, big, large, detached houses, long driveways. And for me, it was a surprise. It's not what I would normally expect in terms of an incident of this type. In the days following his death, Carl Wright's family would describe him as a sweet and gentle son who wouldn't hurt a fly. He was also known to be a popular student and a talented sportsman. Although it looked like from the CCTV footage that the assailant knew the victim, I wasn't 100% sure that it was a targeted attack. So in an investigation like this, when it happens, there are a team of officers that will go out doing house-to-house -house inquiries, and that's normally our uniform colleagues and also our local PCSOs, and it's all hands on deck. We all help each other out. They will go to each house that's in the local area and they will ask a series of questions which involve whether they were there, did they hear anything, did they see anything, do they have any CCTV footage. A single clip could be vital to the investigation, but securing it is not always straightforward. The difficulty with any incident like this with collecting CCTV is that not everybody wants to get involved and those that say they're going to provide the material don't provide it. And I think it's a case of that they're worried of repercussions and also the type of incident that it was with young people and knives. I can understand the reluctance. So therefore, often we would seize the item ourselves, which then prevented the householder from having to attend court at all. By being sensitive to local fear and anxiety, house-to-house -house inquiries begin to yield results. During the house-to-house -house phase, not only did we find some really key CCTV moments, 
but we was also able to find a witness who was able to say to us that he saw an individual matching our suspect's uh, description coming into the area just slightly away from the murder scene on a push bike and locking their push bike up against a lamppost. Which then tied in with the information that came from one of the police units. That's when the bike became important to this investigation. Could the cyclist be the suspect in custody, or is he someone else? As more and more CCTV comes in, Liam begins to track the cyclist's journey, creating a timeline of his movements. Although you couldn't see the suspect's face, you could see clearly the bike and the reflectors on the bike going past. This was important because quite often you have footage from the same location, so you'll see the bike going to the offence scene and you'll see the bike coming away. You can screenshot that image, you can enlarge it, and then you can compare the two images. Even though the person on the bike may have changed their identity by their clothing, i.e. in this case, trousers going towards the scene and shorts coming away from the scene, the bike still looks the same, the frame is the same, the reflectors are the same. Leanne traces the suspect's journey until he reaches Camberley High Street. It's at this point the trail goes cold. However, CCTV footage does prove valuable regarding the man still being held by Surrey police because we also had CCTV that put him somewhere else. I was satisfied that he wasn't involved and, and I was able to release him with no further action just before midnight, Saturday the 28th of May. And from that moment on, we were searching for our suspect on a push bike. Having ruled out one possible suspect, the immediate task at hand is to try and identify the cyclist. As we sifted through the material from the witnesses at the party, a name popped up from one of the accounts. Using that name, we was able to do a significant amount of research in a short period of time, and I was satisfied that I could nominate this individual as a suspect. The reason being that he fitted the description in terms of height, he fitted the description in terms of his appearance, and also that he had a fascination with knives and that he was a violent individual, and lastly, that he was local. The suspected killer has previous convictions involving knives. It's now a matter of urgency to get him into custody as soon as possible. Within two hours, we was able to establish that he was at his place of work, which was the local McDonald's on Camby High Street. The next phase is to plan for his arrest, bearing in mind that he was wanted for murder. There'd been incidents with him and knives in previous months. He was a dangerous individual, he was violent. So it needed a degree of risk assessing to enable colleagues to go and effect that arrest. And they did that at just after five o'clock on Saturday evening. Yeah. A local colleague who was a part of the neighborhood policing team for Camberley, he knew the suspect and he did a professional job in terms of going straight into the restaurant. He knew exactly who he was looking for and the suspect was apprehended as he started work. The suspect, he didn't resist as such, he did protest. John, do you want to be a calm and reasonable in this video, or like you are? Oh, but you risk me or not, I didn't kill anyone! He made various comments that we had already arrested someone, he had no reason to be involved. We tend to get that quite a lot when we, when we make arrests. I'm a family, I didn't kill anyone! I'm a family, you're going to do what I'm going to do. I didn't kill anyone, what do you mean murder? What was the rest that we just been to? I thought someone was in custody. Hey. No, no, no. I thought someone was arrested for him. Why are you arresting me? Jonathan. What are you doing? Search him. So when the suspect was arrested, we conducted a thorough search of him and also of anything that he had access to at his place of work. During the arrest, police recover what appears to be the suspect's bicycle, a rucksack and mobile phone. Your phone? 
Okay, what's the pin for it? The pin. In the moments before the attack, a witness saw the cyclist lock in his bicycle. He also appeared to use his phone. The suspect definitely did have a mobile phone at the time of the murder because CCTV shows an individual walking to the murder scene with a handset in their hand. The pin. Why should I tell you? I didn't do anything. I'm not going to tell you because I didn't do anything. Ooh. OK. In my head, this individual that we've got in custody certainly has a lot of questions to answer. And what followed after that was some of the strangest behaviour I think I've ever seen. It's only the first day of Operation Hillcrest, and Surrey police have a new murder suspect. So let's calm down. how I would when I get falsely accused for murder. John, you're going to make the situation worse for yourself if you keep shouting and swearing, okay. all right? Perfect. Cheers. So when the suspect was arrested, he was brought into custody. I dispatched a team of dedicated specialist interview trained officers to go and interview him. The suspect is accompanied by his solicitor. Got a written statement, which okay. I'm going to read now. And it goes, on the evening of Friday 27th, May 2022, I was at my home address. My brother was also at home. I was not involved in a murder at Greenhill Road as alleged. And that's the end of the statement. Um, Jonathan knows that you are still going to ask him some questions. Yeah. But from this point forward, his answer to every single question that you ask him is going to be no comment. That includes anything that you might show him. The suspect in interview was very confident about his movements. He gave what we call a prepared statement to say that he was not involved in the murder and that he was at home. I'm going to ask you anyway. All right, because I would like you to answer these questions. They're, they're important questions for us to ask, OK? So I'd like you to tell me everything that you know about the death of Kyle Wright. Your call, man. OK. And I'd like you to tell me everything that you did on the night or evening of Friday the 27th of May 2022 until the time that you were arrested on the 28th of May? No comment. OK. It's everyone's legal right to answer no comment, but for me as an SIO, it gives me an elevated sense of suspicion when someone isn't protesting their innocence, isn't climbing the walls, and isn't saying, this wasn't me, I wasn't involved, I was here, I was there, I was doing this, you can check this. And that's what was in my mind during the interview phase. The lack of cooperation may be suspect, but neither the rucksack nor the bicycle found during the arrest match those used by the cyclist on CCTV. The news is also not good regarding the phone. We was able to do a number of checks through the mobile phone service providers, which quickly established that the mobile handset that we recovered from him on his arrest wasn't anywhere near the murder scene. So for us, it gave us another headache as to what device did he have and where is that now? We were also up against a custody clock as well. We only have a maximum of 96 hours to keep someone in custody before we have to make the decision to charge or release. With the clock ticking, the pressure is now on to find physical evidence that will connect the suspect directly to the scene of the crime. I'm Ned Edwards, I'm a sergeant with Surrey and Sussex Police. I work in operations command within the search unit. Ned and I joined the police together 22 years ago. We're good friends outside of work as well as inside of work. For me, he is my go-to search advisor. So at this point, we had an idea of the items we'd be looking for. We knew there was an outstanding murder weapon. We had some identifiable clothing, the backpack, the bicycle, and media items, so mobile phones, computers, laptops, SIM cards. And with someone in custody, one of the primary things is to get the home address searched. Before beginning any search, attention to detail is vital to avoid contaminating the scene. 
what will happen is a forensic strategy will be written and it will identify what we can and can't do. If one of our searchers has somewhere along the line been involved with the suspect or they've been to the scene where the murders happened, what we don't want them is to go to the suspect's address because they could then transfer evidence from the scene to the suspect's address. So in those instances, we're working with the CSI teams, albeit we work really closely together, we need them to go in and do what they have to do first. Nothing is found in the initial forensic sweep, so Ned and his team begin their search. So for a home address, we have to do a lot of planning to search it. So initially we'll draw the floor plans out of the house, we identify the areas we're gonna search, and then they get searched systematically. During the search, we came away with 42 exhibits, and that would be a variety of items. So some knuckle dusters were seized. There were diaries, clothing, mobile phones, and a large knife. This discovery of what looks like a machete immediately puts the rest of the search on hold. This would be considered one of the primary items of a forensic value we're looking for. So our search officers will leave it in situ where they found it, they'll video it or photograph it, and then CSI will be called back into the address. So CSI can maximise their forensic opportunities. Back at the station, the suspect is informed about the discovery, but there is some confusion as to the type of knife police have found. OK, just describe the machete you think we found in your room. It's, it's like sort of like a pirate kind of knife. Right. It looks scary, but it's not a machete. You can forensic it and do whatever you want. So I'll show you a picture of the knife. The photograph I'll call Exhibit RF3. That is blunt. Okay. I thought you were talking about a different one. That is blunt and that is a toy. If you look at it, that's not sharp at all. Okay. It doesn't look like a toy to me. The suspect admits to owning two knives, but the police have only found the machete. So what was the point of having this knife? That's not relevant, because that is not the murder way. What you've got to understand is that that is blunt, okay. and you can friends get whoever. That is we will impossible do. to kill someone we with, will do. unless you hit okay. someone with. But it's relevant if you've got a machete in your bedroom, OK? The machete was examined in a lab, and unfortunately, there was no forensic evidence that was able to match that weapon to the murder. In my experience, I just didn't believe that he would take a murder weapon back to his room and leave it in there. But it was a significant find, and because for us, it showed that the suspect had these sorts of items on him, and we had a knife sharpener and two knuckle dusters, as well as a toy or a replica firearm. I had nothing to do with this murder. Why have you got this, though? There's a time in my life I thought I was cool. I thought all of these knives looked cool, but I've changed my life, everything. OK. There is nothing from the suspect's home to connect him directly to Kyle's murder. But the search does produce one more tantalising lead. The scenes of crime officers went to the address, spotted that there was cameras at the location, and it was seized from the address a couple of days after that, and then it was sent off to be downloaded into a playable format. But until we got that CCTV back, we didn't know what was on it. Having come up empty-handed at the house, Ned quickly moves his search to where the suspect may have disposed of any evidence. The suspect has had effectively maybe 20 hours between the offence and being arrested, and it gives them the time to dispose of these items. You know, people say a needle in a haystack, but we didn't even really know where our haystack was. Those items were so key and so important, the forensic material on those items would lead me to other lines of inquiry. I had a suspect in custody. I was against the pace clock, time was ticking on, and it was frustrating that we didn't have those items. It is now two days since the arrest. Simon can only keep his suspect in custody for a further 48 hours, unless he charges him. But Leanne has news that could change the whole course of this investigation. So the CCTV from the suspect's home address was then returned into a playable format so that we could review it. And the footage actually had footage from two cameras from the front of the property, quite clearly showing people going in and out in real time. The CCTV from his home address showed the fact that he had actually been out during the material time of the murder. So he'd left before and he'd come back after. I was at my home address. My brother was also at home. I was not involved in a murder at Greenhill Road as 
alleged. What followed after that was some of the strangest behaviour I think I've ever seen from a suspect. So after he's returned, minutes later, he leaves in his home address. He then comes back without a rucksack. And this continued the next day with again the same pattern of behaviour. He's out and carrying things, coming back without things. So it just formed a really odd, suspicious picture in my mind of his behaviour on the Saturday. With this new evidence, Simon decides to roll the dice. I was confident that I had sufficient evidence to approach the Crown Prosecution Service and ask them to consider charges of murder against the suspect. It was late in the evening of Monday 29th of May that we prepared our case. The next day, Simon is told he can charge his suspect. There is a sense of relief. That said, you know, we still have the tragic death of a 17-year-old whose family are never going to be the same, and it's where the hard work starts. We only have a limited amount of time to build our case, and we still couldn't find the rucksack, the mountain bike, the clothing, the murder weapon, and we were under pressure in terms of resources. The potential search area is vast, but the suspect's CCTV provides crucial information. The night of the Saturday, we have footage of the suspect leaving his address for short periods of time, maybe seven minutes or so. He goes with things and comes back without it. So the rucksack, potentially the knife, clothing, was put into the short-term hide in case he was arrested overnight so he wouldn't have the items on him. Then he worked to take it to a longer term or permanent hide to get rid of it. So we walked the route where he's seen on the CCTV and looked at places he could go to. It was really clear there's not many places to go, but there was a shrubland area just at the end of the road. While tracking the suspect's route, Ned also spots more cameras. Watching the CCTV, Ned was able to identify a potential route, and that route took him to the next property that had CCTV which then identified the suspect going on a pedal cycle down towards the wooded area. Now, this became important when he returned from that location an hour and 37 minutes later, as he didn't return on his own. Having gone into the woods on the bicycle, he came out on it again with an associate, who then dropped him off and he walked back to the address. So the bicycle that we've been searching for for a couple of weeks was clearly disposed of elsewhere. And what was pivotal to me is that the individual was also carrying a rucksack. So for me as the SIO, absolutely crucial that I identify who this other person is. Through local media, Surrey Police put out an appeal for information. We had an indication of who it was, and we did a number of inquiries to progress that. For Ned, news of a potential associate is only going to widen his search area. And a summer heat wave is not helping either. Temperatures were reaching nearly 40 degrees inside the forest. Some areas were very thick in shrubland. They were searching shoulder to shoulder going through the shrubland. Some days we didn't get very much done at all because of the terrain and the weather. There was a number of finds throughout the whole search process and I did get excited about a couple of things. We did find a bike, we found some items of clothing. However, when we put them through the forensic examinations and visual examinations, we had to rule them out. It appears that the suspects and his associate have successfully covered their tracks. But on social media, investigators have discovered a digital footprint. Is it your phone? Yeah. Okay, what's the pin for it? The pin. Okay. What should I tell you? I didn't do anything. We recovered from our suspect at the time of his arrest a mobile phone device. We was able to do a deep dive into a number of applications that he was attributed to, most notably Snapchat and Instagram. The messages on social media were done because online they thought they would disappear. In this case, they stayed in a area of the phone in its internal memory. So we were able to get these messages back. On his Snapchat account, there was numerous conversations that for me, certainly spoke about the murder, such as that he'd cleaned the knife with bleach, that he'd set fire to the clothing, that he'd buried things. 
Everything is stashed in the forest. I bleached it, but not the handle. And my bike is locked up on another road. I'm so paranoid, man, I don't want to go to Penn. Penn is a slang name for prison. There were messages in which essentially where any person would think that he's admitted it. It's a result. These incriminating messages are the closest thing to the hard evidence Simon has been looking for. They also show that the attack was planned. And as we moved forward, we were able to ascertain from the suspect's Snapchat account that he had mentioned Carl. He had mentioned Carl before the murder. He had mentioned Carl on the 4th of May and a willingness to cause harm to Carl. And having looked at that CCTV of the murder, I was now starting to believe that this was actually a targeted attack. Detectives investigating the murder of Carl Wright now believe his death may have been the result of a local beef or feud fueled by social media. Look at me! 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 We was able to build a picture of two groups of people, Carl, who was from Aldershot, and our suspect, who was from Camberley, and there was some feuding between these two groups, and that had emanated from a house party where these two groups had been involved in a physical altercation with each other. The messages posted the day after the murder are the closest thing to a smoking gun Simon has got, but he's not satisfied. I wanted to close every door. I wanted to top and tail everything in terms of the investigation. Yes, we had key eyewitnesses at the scene in terms of Carl's friends, but we didn't have the murder weapon, the clothing, or anything like that to link to our suspect. As the trial date draws nearer, the search for the associate has also drawn a blank. We sought uh, identification of that person through various different means, through the media, through colleagues, through neighbourhood policing teams that worked in Camberley. But despite all of our efforts to try and identify him, but unfortunately, it was never to be. Without the suspect's associate or any physical evidence, everything now rests on building the strongest circumstantial case possible. So the CCTV strategy for me was a real key part of this investigation but I needed it to be put together in such a way that it gave a really good visual presentation and timeline of the investigation. And that's where Leanne came in. Although the suspect's own CCTV indicated he is lying about his whereabouts, it's up to Leanne to show how he got to the crime scene and back. There's very limited CCTV until he is spotted on the pedal cycle, traveling towards the scene, and then it's process of elimination as to which route he's taken. There was about three or four different routes, and it's a matter of finding a premises along that road that has CCTV, that ideally records the road fully and in real time for the whole time. Although it doesn't seem that long a distance, when you're painstakingly trying to recover CCTV from various different routes, that can be quite challenging. The amount of footage that comes in in this particular case could be up to 150, 200 bits of individual evidence to be looked at. We're talking probably 350 hours worth of video review at the time. So yeah, quite a bit. Despite the amount of footage, there are still blind spots. However, Sources have now provided the police with a number for the missing phone. In this case, there were bits missing. And this is when we start looking at other digital avenues, which include the phone downloads, putting phone evidence in where there's GPRS. So where your CCTV may not put them somewhere, the digital data could put them in that area. And that builds up a bigger picture. Leanne believes she has mapped the suspect's exact route both to and from the crime scene, but there is one final test. One of the actions in this case was to task officers to go and cycle the route from the suspect's home address to the location and then from the offence location back to the home address. 
In this case, it was done and it showed that it was possible. The length of time it took to get to the address was the same as the suspect took and the return journey was exactly the same as what the suspect took. In November 2022, the trial begins. Of course, I get nervous in a trial setting. You know, the spotlight is on you as the SIO. As police officers, we always say that trials court is the best place to learn because anything that you haven't done certainly does get picked up. It's always a difficult time because you think, have I done enough? Have I done enough to be able to paint a clear picture of what's gone on to make sure that we get a result for the family? Without physical evidence, the case hinges on who the jury believes in terms of where the suspect was at the time of Kyle's murder. So during the trial, the defendant gave a number of varying accounts. He wasn't involved in the murder. He was out drug dealing. He was elsewhere. He had nothing to do with it. But he was unable to give us any detail or checkable facts that we were able to then go and verify his account. He also said about the messages in which essentially he's admitted it. He said that he took ownership of those messages to impress a younger friend. It just beggars belief. In December 2022, a jury unanimously found 18-year-old Jonathan Cox guilty of murder. There were no winners in this case. Yes, we got justice for Carl and his family, absolutely. But for me, it opens up uh, more concerning issues around the use of social media, how influenced young people are on social media, and how aggressive people can become. It shouldn't have happened. Some young person's lost their life, and it's a closer to home type job than it would be, especially if you've got children of the same age. It's just very sad, very sad. Cox was 17 when he murdered Kyle, but having turned 18 at sentencing, he was given a mandatory life sentence with a minimum term of 20 years. Carl's family, they're left devastated and broken. He was the youngest son. And I saw firsthand how that ripped that family apart. And in addition to that, the suspect, who again is only 17, his family had been completely ripped apart. It brought home to me such a, a senseless waste of an individual over something that was so trivial. We had two groups of people here who clearly took exception to each other, and that escalated to such a degree that our suspect felt the need to inflict a fatal injury on someone that was at a house party. Before sentencing, the defense argued that Cox had mental health problems and that he did not intend to kill his victim. Nevertheless, the judge described Cox as a dangerous individual who, in the lead up to Kyle's death, had shown a clear intention to do serious harm to his victim. It makes you emotional because, you know, you're so invested in this. You're so invested in doing what's right. It does stay with you, the age of the suspect, the age of the victim, and it's probably something that I will always, always remember in my, in my career. In this case, we relied on really good, hard-working, painstaking, good old detective work and I had a really good team, a dedicated team, that literally worked day and night, and we pursued and pursued because we knew that we had a strong case.